I was a wee bit worried there with the last two um, in incredible speakers that, uh, you know, architecture would seem a bit lightweight in this context. So, like, like maybe a bat people getting a baton handed on it, a relay, I'm going to try and shift it a wee bit for you. Because uh, not only I just turn up to these sort of things and, and show people where I've been on holiday, you know, nice photographs. And don't get me wrong, I mean, that's how I'm trained, so I'm going to do that as well, you know. But I'm going to try and make it mean something to you in the context of other speakers. So I'm going to start off with a really profound statement. Environment affects behaviour. This is something that John understands, that Fiona understands, that most of you probably understand. And, and as the author of that environment, sometimes we have to think about that. We have to think about how people react. Because most of the time, like a building like this, it's a great building, do you know? And it will probably make you feel good about yourselves, particularly if you've come from a bad building. But you may not be able to articulate that, you know? And that's about how people respond to that environment. So um, I'm, I'm going to try and do that for you and make that connection with two cities in, uh, in Scotland. But first of all, a lot of people think, uh, as the most accessible of the arts, architecture, because it's all around you, it's also one of the most slow moving. But I've got a couple of slides here um, to maybe give a wee bit of a lie to that. This is Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai in 1991. And this is it 14 years later. Um, do you know that phrase that you grew up um, with your dad saying, uh, you know, I, I remember it was all green fields around here. The, <laughs> There's teenagers in Dubai make that, make that statement, do you know? Incredible, economic imperative here. Similar time frame, Shanghai. Um, and that's what it's like now, you know? Political imperative. Strange to, be, strange to be saying there's a political imperative from one of the most conservative governments uh, on the planet, but let's come back to that thought a wee bit later on. Opposite end of the spectrum. Venice, I'm sure a place a lot, a lot of people know very well. Looks like it was carved out of a single piece of stone on a single day in the 12th century. If you added something to it contemporary, it wouldn't feel right. If you took something away from it, it wouldn't feel right. Opposite ends of the spectrum of how environments affect us and how we think about them and how they can transform people's lives. It's a bit of a trick question. How many people would quite like to live in something like this in the future? If there's any arms go up here, there's a bit of detention for you afterwards. <laughs> and we're going to be having words. It, it looks, I don't know what it looks like. It looks groovy in a kind of funny kind of way. But do you know this? That, that's the sort of groovy equivalent of the Red Road Flats. Do you know? It's, it's an idea of architecture in the future that's propelled by technological advance. And the one thing it kind of lacks is an understanding of how people affect architecture. Do you know? So... This is a very quick slide um, on what architecture is really all about. The bits that happen in that circle there are all of the obvious things. What is it you're trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? You know? So if you take the two most important things on the left-hand side out of that, then you get things like the Red Road Flats because you get architects who don't actually think about what it's like to live in that vertical community in the sky without that essence of how we communicate with each other on a daily basis. I sort of think in Scotland we understand this better than anywhere else in the world and I'm going to try and prove it to you now. Architecture is about people. You know, there's, there's a connection to everybody, everybody's thoughts throughout the day. For it to be truly transformational it needs to do these three things and it needs to do them in absolute balance. You know, not one more important than the other. We need to learn from the past. We need to understand the present and then look for the clues in the way we want to try and live, uh, be it how we communicate with each other, be it how we culturally develop, you know, and then plan that into the future and anticipate what that's going to be like. So here's a wee story. Glasgow, my home city, even though I'm adopted uh, from Kilmarnock, and that's where my heart is now. Glasgow, um, that's just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Do you not think so? You know, it's Google Map area of Glasgow. It's ordered. It's coordinated, it's connected, but there's a bit in the middle that I've highlighted in red for you that seems a wee bit out of order there. It's called Tradeston. It's got a sole tire cross of infrastructure that's tearing it apart, the M74, the, the rail line that comes through the Union City. It's a real problem, do you know? And it's right in the center of the city. And the funny thing is, 
110 years ago, there was a community there. And it was a community before the car, so everybody walked everywhere. You know, we had Scotland Street School. You, you lived in a tenement. You, you went to the pub on the corner. You, the, there's churches there on that left-hand image. All that community was there. Um, we didn't knock it down because community was bad. We knocked it down because they were badly built and there were social issues with the way the housing was. But the, the methodology of how you put that together was there. So hold on to that a minute. But then something changed, you know. Industry came along and industrial values placed greater emphasis on land in certain areas. You know, Tradeston was badly hit by that. Um, and it lost that community and that sort of started to happen. Um, the one thing I will say is we didn't lose a sense of ourselves because that tiny wee building on the corner is the pub, you know. So, <laughs> so we killed the community and we took all the housing away, but we left the pub, you know what I mean? Because there's got to be reason in these things, do you know? Um, but there's still exceptional pieces of architecture there, and they now stand out as, you know, relics of a bygone age. Scotland Street School, I'm very fond of it, obviously, because Charles Rennie McIntosh is a former partner of my practice. So, you know, we, we value this heritage that Glasgow has, and, and, it, and we need to look after it. So we need to think about what we're going to do with it. And these sheds that are left are relics of a bygone age. The industry's gone. So what are we going to do with it? What, what, how can we think about that? So I mentioned earlier on an economic imperative and a political imperative. I'm going to talk to you about a cultural imperative, which is actually the best kind of imperative, because it definitely makes everybody feel good about themselves. But that shed um, has got an incredible history. Do you know? Um, one of the mechanisms that uh, powers the San Francisco Cable Car Company and the very first subway in Glasgow, which was one of the first in the world, was made in that shed. You know? Latterly, just before it all closed, the drilling mechanism that powered the Channel Tunnel, made in that shed. You know? From the days when we actually invented the world, Scots. You know, so this is a holiday snap. So we found ourselves in China. Uh, and don't worry, I'll connect the dots of all this, you know, in case you think that's the tradesman story finished. We come back to that in a minute. We found ourselves in China, we were doing quite a lot of work in China, um, and we literally stumbled on this amazing place called 751 Art District. Any art students, any art lecturers, go and check it out. It's absolutely incredible. It looks like this at the moment, and it's effectively a massive district of industrial uh, buildings and, and an environment, which um, very strangely, the Chinese government decided to give over to an artistic community uh, and allow them to adapt it and adopt it. And as Fiona knows, um, the artistic community are very good at making do with what they're given because they don't very often get good handouts from governments. Um, you know, so an artistic community see beauty and creativity and everything, do you know? And these buildings are incredibly beautiful, you know? So a community moved in with the Chinese government in Beijing, most conservative government on earth, possibly, you know, um, very, very worried about the nature of culture and development and the free thought that that brings, but still allowed this to happen. And film companies started appearing because they saw the value and the character of the buildings. Film companies, artistic companies, galleries opened everywhere. All of a sudden, people thought, there's a buzz to this place. And people started living there as well, you know. So a community grew up around this. Took a period of time, but nonetheless, it became known for that cultural renaissance. A piece of land that was sort of worthless in terms of its previous life had now been re reborn. And everything became a canvas for artwork. My photographs won't do this justice, honestly. You know, um, everything is uh, available as a space where you can see unique beauty in it. Um, it's just the most incredible place. Um, Sandy Stoddart would love it because you can't throw a stone in any direction without hitting a piece of public art. There's um, a statue there with a man at work sign and there was a hole in the road next to it and we kind of thought, is this just an unusual way of trying to make sure people don't fall down that hole, you know? Um, and you're almost sort of thinking, where's the traffic cones, do you know? Because um, that's how we do that in this country, you know? Um, and this one here... Uh, has that wee phrase on it. I don't know if you can see it at the bottom. And that's the title of the piece, actually. So, back to Tradeston. We came back with all these ideas. We thought, well, if they can do it there, why can we not do that in Tradeston? Why can we not 
try and think about a cultural renaissance in a bit of Glasgow that's based on culture, where we actually use the sheds that you saw earlier on as backdrop to people's lives, you know, interesting, characterful backdrop, you know, an environment that tells a story of what it once was. We don't do that thing in, that we used to do in the, the 70s and 80s, where when something didn't have a value, we knocked it down and we just built something new that had none of these things. The reason we don't do it is because nobody's getting any money anymore. So, you know, that... If, if there's any advantages to coming through the economic crisis that we've come through, it's that people look at things differently now, you know, and there's, there's less of a short-termism in how all these things work. But we thought maybe we could start to create a new community and a new environment. We could introduce new buildings in that had a reference to that thing that you saw at the beginning in Tradeston, where that community all worked together. You know, it was mixed use. It wasn't single planning zoning, if, if you know what that means, which kind of kills urban planning, do you know? Everything's either got to be all industrial or everything's got to be all this and the next thing. These things don't work. They don't work. You need to create places for people because that's why cities actually emerged in the first instance. It's not the commerce of economics, it's the commerce of ideas. The very thing that we're doing today, talking to each other, exploring ideas about how we can be better people, do you know? That's what architecture does because it creates that environment that people feel better about themselves. But people got to live there as well, you know? And there's a place for nature in the city, and the project I'll show you after this is kind of all about that, you know? Bringing in a different kind of environment. That whole thing about cities working better when there's busy spaces and there's quiet spaces and there's places that you can contemplate and there's places that you can be inspired. And it doesn't all have to be exceptional architecture. Sometimes the exceptional is reinforced by the ordinary. You know, there's got to be hierarchy in these things. And then you see an image there of Scotland Street School that I showed you earlier on, and how it, it could become part of a new community, and not part of a new community that's totally dominated by the roads and the infrastructure and the cars. Because if you choose to live that close to the city centre, there's a fair likelihood that you'll be happy to walk into the city centre across all the bridges that are now, uh, that are now developing. Do you know, it's a different way of looking at how cities operate. And there's an image of only part of it that maybe references that early thing. How can we hold on to that order and that, that grandeur that Glasgow's really all about and, and reinterpret that for the future? So, you know, there's a subtext in us actually that the architects of the future, unlike that thing we showed you earlier on, the architects of the future might look a lot more like the past than might, we might be willing to admit, you know? And put together in a way actually where, um, you know, that. Everything works, the infrastructure works. We're not gonna take it away, we're not gonna take, don't worry, we're not gonna take the M74 extension away. It provides a valuable purpose now, you know? But it needs to integrate and work on a multi-level and multi-layered basis with the community that's around it, not destroy it, you know? And, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens on the edge of the M74 because that's the, primor that's the primary reason why we put it there in the first place. Jumping about again, New York. Um, this, the project I'll show you after this in Aberdeen, we worked with a fantastic uh, practice called Diller Scafidio and Renfro, who did the High Line. I don't know if any of you know the High Line. Um, I'm going to say this quite a lot, but you know, I'm, I'm really lucky in the job that I do. It's an amazing place as well. You know, the High Line is the number one tourist attraction in New York now, and it, it's a reclaimed linear urban park and reclaimed from an elevated rail line, you know, that did nothing, do you know? Took the trains into uh, the top of 10th Avenue, and then when the trains went away, it did nothing, do you know? So um, we went to have a look at it, um, and it's, it's just amazing, absolutely amazing. You wouldn't believe it. A, a story Fiona really like, you know, when, when they built it and people walk across it, and it's another way of looking at the city and getting across the city, it, it skirts its way through a number of different buildings and environments and, and residences right next to it. And they, when they finished it, they found amazing things had started to happen. Um, just things that really made me laugh. And, and I thought it was great when I saw it. And I wish I had a photograph of it. But um, a woman who was really into opera and singing opera uh, has a balcony that's quite close to the way the High Line walks and where a lot of people sit for their lunch. And every day at one o'clock, like a cuckoo clock, you know, she comes out onto this balcony and performs this aria. You know, it's unbelievable, do you know? And all of a sudden, the High Line's provided an audience for that woman, do you know? And 
Stories like that, tiny wee stories about how people's lives are affected in a different way by well-considered and well-thought-out architecture are, are really what we try and do. You know, you try and create these um, elements of background to people's lives because they don't have to think about why it's great. They just need to know that it is. You know, it just, it's, it's how you feel about things. And a thing I'd never thought I would ever say, you know, they opened up this bridge to create a place for people to sit and have lunch and watch the traffic going up 10th Avenue. Um, and it's mobbed every day, do you know? Uh, the most amazing thing to sit and watch traffic driving up 10th Avenue and think that that's great. But you're in the heart of one of the busiest cities in the world. And you've got this wee oasis sitting above all of this, just sitting watching it. It's so well considered. Pointing that to Tradeston, we've got one of them. Union City Line. Most of you probably don't even know it's there. But it comes out of Tradeston, it goes into the back of the Brigitte at that point there, and into the back of uh, St. St. Enoch Centre. It's lying dormant. The rail lines don't use it anymore. It's actually halfway to be in the High Line because it's overgrown. There's trees hanging about all over the place on it. And look at the quality of that bridge. Do you know? That's something that we could actually do to reconnect the city and provide an interesting adaptation of something that's no longer in use, that would make such a difference to people's lives. It would encourage them to walk more. It would connect the south side to the north side on the south side of the city. It would re regenerate an already regenerated Lauriston and the Gorbals. You know, simple ideas. It's not rocket science. Aberdeen. This is where it will get emotional for me because I'm probably going to burst into tears about this project. And, and you may know why if you know what the project's about. Um, Aberdeen is an incredibly interesting place. Uh, and the centre of it, outlined in green there, is lives cheek by jowl with the most amazing harbour um, and activity there. But it's, it's, a, it's a city that's, its identity has changed over the last 40 years. It used to be a fishing village, you know. Now it's on the verge of being one of the energy and oil capitals of the world. And it doesn't quite know how to balance what it was to what it wants to be. And that's, there's conflict in there. Now, conflict from an architectural point of view can sometimes be a really good thing, do you know, because you get to understand different aspects of people's perspective. Um, big parks in the middle of cities uh, provide a really valuable function. Do you know, that's probably the most famous one. Um, and whilst the Aberdeen one's not anywhere near the scale of that, it does perform a similar function. It allows the city to breathe a bit. You know, it should connect different parts of the city in a way that at the moment only Union Street does. Um, but it's got a problem. It's a hole in the ground. You know, it's, it's, it's a cavity that is very inaccessible. That photograph probably won't show you, but it's a Victorian park, you know. Um, Victorians didn't really think about how disabled people actually got to different levels. They just built loads of steps, do you know? So now you think, well, it's, it's, it's a thing that needs to adapt and change to a different set of circumstances and a different set of social rules. If you know anything about the project, you'll know it was very divisive in Aberdeen. This is actually a banner from the people who were against the project. And I totally agree with that. Aberdeen is a city with a green heart. It's just a problem with the heart wasn't really beaten, you know? There was no pulse there. Because everybody looked at the park and thought, this is something to be looked at and admired. It's not something to engage with. And that's a real shame. You know, you can't imagine people just circumnavigating Central Park in New York and pointing into it and going, that's a fantastic place. We need it to actually make some sense of the way people live in cities. So another thread that people have been talking about today, the words at the bottom there, ask, listen, understand, explore, and tell. That's a design process, you know. Um, but it's also a process for life. You know, it, it was what Fiona was talking about. It was what John was talking about. Um, and, you know, you have to understand people's per perspectives on things. So we thought that's what we'll do. We'll go out and ask people. We'll interview people before we'd drawn a line. You know, the old fella there, um, really interesting, told us a story that it used to be called the Trainee Park. And the reason it used to be called that was because in a different environment, people, families would take their kids onto the slopes of, of the park to watch the steam trains. You know, and quite, a, quite a, a new thing and an interesting thing for that, for that time for, for him as a, as a young boy to go and see that. Um, and we also found out that, you know, Aberdeen as a multi-layered city, um, you know, part of the fact it's multi-layered was a functional thing. It needed to connect from a sewage point of view to the harbour, you know, things we don't do nowadays, but nonetheless, the industrial process drove that. 
And that's a really impressive slide from the time when you did have, you know, trains going through there and it was something to watch. But with all due respect to ScotRail, people are not going to take their kids to that part now to watch the 915 from Inverness coming in. We just, we don't kind of do that anymore, you know? So we've got other things in our life. We need to adapt these spaces to the way we actually want to live now. This is a wee uh, film that I'm not going to speak over, but it's very quick to show what we tried to do in terms of that connection. And it explains the design ideas before I talk about some of the images behind it. So it's still a park, but it's got other things in it now, and I'm going to have to go quickly here because I'm sort of running out of time. It's got a nightlife, you know. We've created something that was never there before. We've given it activity at night. We've made it a social space. We've given it a civic frontage to Union Street. Union Street's very linear. It doesn't have any breaks in it at the moment, so it now has that. Um, activity all year round, you know. The thing can change into an ice rink on the auditorium space. Um, but also that sort of contemplative space we were talking about earlier on, framed views of different things, so that heritage is still there and it's still part of that experience. Different things to do at night, but also activity, you know, the, the art galleries and everything sort of buried underneath the landscape because it provides a commercial aspect to what Aberdeen's all about and it starts to change its identity. But above all, and this is the last slide, it's about people, you know, it's about how people engage with these spaces and creating things that um, you know, people will resonate with. The final four words I'm gonna leave you with, I think are probably the most important words you'll hear or see all day. They're not mine, they're from a hero of mine, um, Joe Strummer. Um, without people, you're nothing, do you know? And if there's a thread between all of the speakers that I've heard earlier on today, that's sort of it, you know? That's my attempt to try and stitch architecture into the emotional connection of everything else. It's all about people. Thank you.